and two channels on POG and also being uh, live on WBRT, I believe. Uh, channel 20, 20.1 and YouTube and then WBRT, I think. All right, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. It's uh, six o'clock, so uh, we'll welcome everyone and uh, just want to state why this is uh, a special meeting and even though it's a normal meeting night for us, uh, it's due to the coronavirus uh, COVID-19 state of emergency pursuant to KRS 61.823. Paragraph three, four, and five, and in accordance with opinion 20-05 of the Kentucky Attorney the General, there will not be a physical location for the public and or media to view the meeting. This meeting will be broadcast for public viewing on Barstown Cable TV at 20.1 on POG and uh, on the City of Barstown YouTube channel. And I think also it's on WBRT as radio as well. Uh, Pursuant to the Office of Attorney General's 20.05, under these exceptional circumstances in which public agencies are confronting a worldwide uh, pandemic while nevertheless needing to accomplish uh, critical public business, KRS 61.840 excuses agencies from providing a primary physical location uh, for public viewing because it's not feasible uh, to do so in the face of a highly contagious virus and that spreads between people who are in close contact with one another within uh, six feet. So that being said, I'll get into the agenda. Uh, since Kim Houston is on the call, uh, the reason she's on the call is she has been involved a great deal in our um, Barstown COVID-19 relief project. So uh, I'm gonna go to that part of the agenda first, which is under ordinances. And um, we have B2000, 20-05, a budget amendment, fiscal year 19 and 20, Barstown COVID relief project. Uh, I would ask someone to introduce that uh, budget amendment. Mayor, if I'm in order, ordinance number B2020-05, an ordinance amending and adopting an amended ordinance number B 2019-07, the city of Bardstown's budget ordinance for the fiscal year, July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. Thank you. Uh, I guess Audrey, you'll need to uh, read that ordinance uh, and you can refer to the, the uh, summary once you get to that point, I think. Sure. Um, ordinance number B 2020-05, an ordinance amending and adopting as amended, amended ordinance number B 2019-07, the city of Bardstown's budget ordinance for the fiscal year July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. Whereas an annual budget for fiscal year 2019 through 2020 was adopted by the city council of the city of Bardstown on June 26, 2019. And whereas there have been unanticipated changes in both revenues and expenditures during that time, now, therefore, be it ordained by the City of Bardstown, Kentucky, that Section 1, the annual budget for the fiscal year 2019 through 2020, be amended by the following reappropriations. Number one, transfer 24500 to the Community Development Grants line item from the following accounts. A, 6000 from Mayor's Contingency. B, 7000 from Council Contingency. C, 5000 from Council Training Expenses. D, 6500 from Travel and Conference Expenses. Number two, transfer $65,000 to a newly created line item titled Bardstown Emergency Relief Grants from the following accounts. A, $25,000 from Software Police. B, $30,000 from Building Street. C, $10,000 from Improvement Other Than Building Street. Section two, the annual budget is hereby attached here to, reflecting the above referenced amendments to the general fund revenues and expenditures that comprise the fiscal year 2019 through 2020 budget for the city of Bardstown. The reappropriations approved in this amendment do not change the overall ending balance of the general fund budget. 
and then it, the summary is listed below on the chart. Section three, all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict are hereby repealed to the extent of that conflict. This ordinance shall be in full force and effect following publication as required by law. This summary was certified by me, Audrey Hayden, city attorney. Okay, uh, thank you, Audrey. And uh, I'm gonna kind of back up now and sort of give a little uh, introduction to how we got to this point because it has taken a great deal of effort by a lot of people. And uh, it started back uh, literally about a day or so after our last meeting. Our last meeting was three weeks ago because we had five Tuesdays in uh, March. So um, Councilman Hibbs and Councilman Hart, Councilwoman Hart had they had talked to me earlier about this uh, program uh, that we're gonna talk about here in a minute, the Bardstown Blessings Donation. And um, they felt like, you know, with this virus situation, maybe this was the time to bring that up for uh, us to take some more serious uh, consideration of it. And that, with that discussion, I kind of likened it to a, a pebble started rolling down a hill and uh, three weeks later, it's become a full blown boulder and, uh, and uh, is uh, kind of got some steam behind it and we're, we're happy where we are today. But from that conversation with uh, Councilwoman Hart and Councilman Hibbs, uh, uh, I got in touch with Kim Houston about talking to her about what things might uh, the chamber and Main Street feel like needed to be done. And um, we thought about United Way and Councilman Hibbs kind of worked as the liaison between them and, um, and between uh, Kim and myself and Betty and Frank and then uh, Audrey Hayden. Uh, she got in on the legal side, but also on helped us on the operational side as we talk with a number of uh, cities. Um, uh, we consulted with uh, Mayor Fisher's office and uh, the mayor's office over in New Albany and E-Town and Paducah. And a lot of these cities had put together some relief plans. And while we were a little bit late uh, because of the three week uh, difference between our last meeting and now, I think the good news is that we learned a lot from these other cities as we talked to them and uh, we got some lessons learned. Uh, we asked questions like, well, what would you have done different? And so those were some really good uh, points that we uh, took from these uh, cities that have done their own relief plans. And that's where we have uh, come to this today so that we uh, have a kind of a four pronged uh, attack on the uh, effects, the economic effects of the coronavirus here in Barstown, Nelson County through the United Way and our small business relief plan. And then the phase two, which is a recovery pl plan. And then the Barstown blessing uh, donations plan. So uh, you have all those in your uh, uh, agenda. We'll, I guess, talk first about the uh, United Way uh, project and um, I'm just going to kind of give an overview and if anyone has questions on each of these um, you know we decided to uh, and we also I've left out Aaron Bowles our CFO he played a big part in this because he he's been juggling all these uh, funds as we developed some plans uh, we wrote them up Kim and I and Betty and uh, Aaron and Lisa and Gary and uh, we uh had Audrey review them and, and uh, other, uh, some bankers and some accountants in town look at them to see if they uh, pass muster and, uh, and they kept evolving. But uh, uh, Aaron played a big part helping us juggle the funds that are available. So our goal is on the uh, United Way is to put $20,000 into their funds uh, immediately to be used for Barstown based uh, organizations especially those who we have not given to this year and we're going to make twenty thousand dollars available for grants up to two thousand dollars to uh, eight or ten of these organizations uh, including united way themselves because their uh, payroll uh, deduction money is going to be greatly uh, impacted because of the uh, virus and the all the layoffs and shutdowns so uh, that's the purpose of, of that twenty thousand dollars and uh, 
I talked to Laura, the executive director there, and I know Councilman Hibbs has as well, and she's, they are right in their uh, period right now where they're receiving applications for these funds as we speak. So the timing is very good. So we think the uh, $20,000 will be uh, able to be spread to organizations that are, uh, we want to focus on those that are really involved in the mitigation of this effect of the uh, coronavirus, uh, such as you know, organizations like the Red Cross and the Food Pantry and school resource centers and on and on. There's quite a few that are eligible. And then um, I'm happy to report that uh, with this fund and our, and our uh, grant fund, uh, several local businessmen have been reaching out to me uh, over the last several weeks uh, saying that, you know, they'd like to help. And uh, at the time we didn't really have a financial way, so to speak, but since this has evolved, uh, some of these businesses have stepped up. So there's gonna be $15,000 uh, to go along with our $20,000 for this fund. And uh, thanks to the work of Ken Houston talking with the uh, Nelson Community Foundation and also in conjunction with the Louisville Community Foundation and Audrey's uh, review of this, uh, we found out that uh, these businesses, they can donate directly to the city of Largetown uh, just as just as though we are a 501c3 charitable organization, then these monies are earmarked for the public good like they are under this plan that we're putting out tonight, the United Way plan, the small business relief, and uh, further on the phase two recovery. So uh, United Way will get um, 20,000 from the city and another 15,000 uh, immediately uh, upon the second reading of this ordinance, which uh, will be tomorrow. So that's the United Way part of this. Has anybody got any questions regarding this project at this time? Mayor, if I could. Sure. Okay. Uh, just, just to make a point and someone can correct me, but the United Way, they almost have no administrative costs and the money that we donate will be used right here in Nelson County. That's correct. We've, we've told uh, Laura that it's a Tri-County United Way, but these funds will only be used uh, really for Bargetown-based uh, charities and organizations. They do have some uh, smaller costs, not directly operational costs, but they do provide some uh, help to uh, uh, groups and individuals that really weren't listed like their grant uh, list that I, I reviewed, but uh, it's a, it's a small amount there, but um, they do have some needs uh, just to keep their organization going. They don't operate completely without any overhead. So uh, I would not, I told them I would not be opposed if they wanted to make a application to us through our normal community grant foundation or excuse me, community grant fund uh, requesting some of these funds for their own use, but it would have to be outlined uh, if we were to approve those. Mayor, may I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so uh, United Way is gonna vet all of those entities for us, is that correct? Yes, and they supplied us with a list uh, already, which are uh, usually, there are already a number of agencies that are on their annual giving program. Uh, many that, many of them on the list are some that we've already given to uh, this year through our community grant program. But yes, they uh, they do all the vetting on that. And uh, okay. I'm, I'm confident we're not gonna have to be concerned about the uh, appropriateness of the use of these funds. I agree, because we'll be busy, or Aaron or whoever will be busy with the uh, small business relief vetting. Right. Okay, any other questions on the uh, small business, or excuse me, the United Way part of this? If not, then we'll move into the Small Business Relief Program, which is a uh, another program that uh, really is open up to uh, all small businesses located within the city limits of Bardstown. Uh, we do have some uh, various requirements to this, which was in your packet. I won't read it word for word, but the small business would be defined as a business of 
annual sales of a million dollars or less or has less than 50 employees and they need to have been opened by January 1st of this year. Uh, of course, they obviously have to be current with their tax payments to the city and their net profit submissions. And that, of course, currently have a Bargetown business license. And these would not be uh, available to franchise or franchise affiliated businesses. Um, the program, we're gonna open the application part uh, Monday, April the 20th and accept applications through uh, May the 4th. And then we will have a uh, committee of I think three will review these applications and decide on who uh, will be the recipients of these grants. Uh, I will not be a member of that uh, committee um, so we have an application. That, this should be up on our website by Monday where the overview will be on there and a separate link will uh, open up for the uh, application. And then uh, they can submit it either through the computer or uh, drop it off here or mail it to us. Um, we have a few other criteria, which is uh, the eligible businesses that we have identified and uh, also some uh, non-eligible. And, and let me just reiterate again that the whole purpose of this uh, effort is to provide some assistance to those businesses that uh, as a result of the governor's executive order that have been forced to close and who have been uh, greatly impacted. You know, you take a restaurant for instance, that went from being able to have a dining room service to just strictly curbside you know, that's what we mean by greatly impacted. And there's a lot of businesses that have just flat been closed. So that's really the uh, purpose for the, uh, the grant program. So it would include retail businesses, uh, barber and beauty salons, uh, service related businesses like appliance repair and locksmiths, of course, restaurants and childcare and daycare. And then, you know, any small business that has been closed by the governor's executive order. And there's some uh, non-eligible businesses. And again, the reason they have non-eligible because these are the type of businesses that have not been ordered to be closed or have not been drastically uh, impacted by the governor's order. And also many of their uh, employees are eligible for uh, unemployment, which we're finding a number of people, uh, the unemployment checks are actually bigger than what they were making before uh, they were uh, impacted by this. So. The non-eligible businesses, and again, we put this together based on a uh, review of four or five other cities' uh, programs and, and their, their advice, quite frankly. Uh, home, op home occupations, real estate companies and their agents, attorneys, uh, financial advisors, accounting firms, food trucks, not-for-profit organization, and then landlords, uh, and rental property owners, those would be excluded from being able to apply for this grant program. So that's kind of a quick overview. Um, right now we have, uh, the city's gonna be putting in 65,000, which is part of that uh, ordinance we just referred to, Audrey just read uh, through those line item changes. And then um, the private sector has, uh, just like they did with the uh, United Way, private sector has kicked in another 15,000. So we'll be starting this grant program with $80,000. And um, based on once we open it and the uh, applications, we will try to uh, provide grants to as many businesses as possible who qualify and as for as long as this uh, money ho uh, holds out. And um, I'm hoping after this evening and with the help of the media, that we will uh, invite other businesses and individuals who feel, uh, who maybe their businesses haven't been impacted to contribute to this fund. And they can do so, uh, and it's a charitable, charitable deduction uh, through the city. So um, we hope we'll, this fund will grow because uh, I know E-Town and Paducah uh, had that happen once they rolled their program out. So we hope the same thing happens for us and so this I would love to see it grow to 100,000 from the 80 that we're gonna start with. So, um, Kim, do you have anything to add to that part uh, based on everything? I've, uh, I know you were involved in a lot of these phone calls and discussion. Kim Houston. Oh, sure, Mr. Mayor, thank you. And um, to get 
to do the application process. And it's, it's probably good that we were able to come in a little bit later than some of the other programs because they, they had changes they wish they could make. So I think we were doing the best of the best of these programs. What happens when we actually get all the applications in that come into the city hall? The first pass through will be basically to the finance department, maybe to the, the clerk's department. And at that time, they're gonna to look to make sure they have a city license. They're gonna make sure all their financial information is correct. And basically what they're gonna do, they're gonna look at the application, make sure it's correct. And then if it's not, they'll get back with the employer and say the business and say, we left this off, we still need this information. Or they'll say, your application really doesn't fit. You're not qualified to do this for this reason, this reason, or this reason. So once it goes through the first pass, it actually goes through a, a, a second pass. And then we find out, make sure that uh, they're not a landlord or uh, anything else that's needed in that final pass. And then the third one is when all these applications have been vetted and all the applications are correct, then it will go to the, the selection group that the, the mayor will choose. And then they will have an opportunity. And what we are doing is it's up to $2,000. Not everybody is going to get $2,000. Lots of it may be based on the, the monetary value of the company. Some people in the Elizabethtown program who's doing $3,000, they're like, the company makes you know a million dollars. Another company makes $100,000. Does one do $3,000? Does one do $1,000? So you know, there's some criteria. We know there's going to be some gray area in this, and we're prepared for that. But I think we got some smart people who are going to be working with us on this and uh, we'll be able to, to answer some of those questions. So I feel real confident. I'm just hoping that we're able to get the word out to the businesses and the companies that have, a lot of them have very much benefited by this and uh, they're wanting to do something. That's what we're hearing in my office right now. People are just wanting to do something. They're wanting to be able to spend their money to do something. And this is a great program to do that. So we're really, really hoping that we'll get some donations from other companies in and keep more and more business to be able to do this. When Elizabethtown did it, they had 160 applications uh, for their program through the first pass, and they're expecting more to come in uh, at the end too. So fingers crossed we'll have quite a few that will come in, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Kim. That was some good stuff. And and um, the, also the purpose of these grants too are to help businesses meet, you know, again, the least small businesses, um, you know, they might be getting some of this PPP money uh, down the road, but many of them have racked up rent that they haven't been able, maybe not been able to pay in the month of March and part of April. They've got uh, insurance expenses ongoing. They got utilities that are ongoing. Uh, they got probably equipment rental that might be paid, uh, you know, vehicle expenses, and the list goes on and on for these small businesses that, uh, you know, literally the light has been turned off on their businesses as a result of this virus. So we think that, uh, again, based on the other cities that we talked to, that $2,000 is going to be uh, up to $2,000 is the right number that these people can qualify for to really help them going forward. Um, would anyone else like to ask any questions about this while we have uh, him with us? <clears throat> okay, uh, if no other questions on that, I, I, Kim, I'd like to ask you if you would, uh, let's talk a little bit about our phase two of this same uh, kind of effort, uh, which is uh, something that you and I started talking about last week when we got heavy into this. Uh, you mentioned that we also need to be thinking about how we uh, help these businesses in the recovery stages. So if you'd like to share some of that information you've been sharing with me uh, about that. Well, it was interesting that I, I sat in on a webinar today for about an hour and the gentleman who hosted it, his name is Michael Tracy. And he's a gentleman that we brought in here to do a strategic planning uh, session for the leaders of, of Bardstown just about a couple of years ago. And he works with a lot of large companies. And the whole purpose of the meeting was post-COVID-19. What, what does your community look like? What does your company look like? Um, 
Are we going, is, is a restaurants going to be different? Are the size of the dining rooms going to be different? Are they going to base more on uh, delivery now? Are there going to be less office buildings, people working from home? I find that, I think people are finding that that works. So one of the most important things I think that we're thinking about right now is post COVID-19 and, and what Bardstown looks like, what businesses will survive. Unfortunately, we, we know some will not. We have heard that. Uh, some that are closed now may not open their doors again. And so we're going to be working. We've got bankers, uh, former business people, uh, school people, lay people, just people that are really wanting to, to share some of their expertise with us and to see how we can go forward in this. I mean, we know what's going on now and the things that we can do now. Bardstown's going to change and our businesses are going to change. And we want to help make sure those changes are applicable for them and we can do whatever we need to do to look at those changes. Right now, we are having a tourism executive committee meeting. You can imagine tourism operates 100% funding on restaurants and on hotels. We're expecting to have about 10% of our budget over the next couple of months. So we're looking at tourism as well too, as these other companies are looking at their bottom line. So. That's what a bunch of smart people in, in this community want to get together and talk about it and move the companies forward when all this is over with. And I think Kim and I have talked, we don't know it yet, but uh, there may be a financial uh, second phase of this uh, grant program that we may, hopefully with some help from the private sector, uh, develop some additional funds to help out uh, with these startup costs that these businesses might be experiencing you know, we're not sure exactly the time. It could be, um, you know, two months from now. It might be longer. But uh, if the need's there, we, we hope to have some funding available. Uh, and that, of course, will happen after our uh, new budget. So hopefully we may be able to assist there. And I'm really hoping that uh, our business community will step up as well. Uh, and I think they will. Anyone have any questions on the phase two, the recovery plan, this is kind of a conceptual discussion tonight, but um, we'll be more heavy in it as we put together this group of people to uh, work on this project. Okay, um, the last part of this, and it's not the least part of this uh, relief program is the Barstown Blessing donation boxes, because as I said earlier, uh, had Betty and Hart and Frank Hibbs maybe not uh, push me a little bit on this. We may not have gotten to where we are today on these other relief funds. And um, I think it, it's a uh, perfect timing uh, for this project. So I'll turn this over to uh, Councilwoman Hart and Councilman Hibbs uh, to talk about this, this part of it. I'll yield the floor to Councilman Hibbs. Well, thanks, Betty, and uh, <laughs> thank you, Mayor, too, for allowing us to bring this for uh, this in front of you. And and I'm really glad it's kind of taken uh, taken off and got to to where it is with your guidance and your leadership. And you know, this kind of came up in a safety committee meeting a few months ago with Betty and I and, and Bill, and uh, we had, had got this idea from uh, actually one of our citizens here who had saw this uh, doing really well at a different uh, a different city and wondered why we couldn't do the same. And once all this uh, coronavirus re really started hitting, uh, hitting the community really hard, we realized that we really needed to get this off the ground and running. And what we want to do is actually just put uh, five of these boxes uh, out in the community and uh, well, we'll take care of, uh, you know, uh, build them and everything, getting them, getting them set up. And we really want to encourage the media and the citizens of Bardstown to, uh, when you make a grocery run, donate just a little bit of canned food, some uh, non-perishable items that uh, maybe people could really use that don't uh, don't have the means to get to the to the food pantries or anything and we really hope that it would make a be a small step uh, uh, but be a very beneficial step in the community and uh, we really are, are happy and, and proud to, to get these uh, get these moving and get them built and uh, installed here hopefully as quickly as possible and then I think the other good news is don't you have uh some donations lined up and your uh, uh, Mr. Hagen lined up to build these for us. Yeah, hats off to Betty and I'll, I'll let her talk about this too. She's uh, 
She's uh, done a great job soliciting some uh, some help, uh, some donations in materials and donations in uh, in actually building the boxes themselves. So we're gonna take it away to bit. Well, we're lucky to have such good community partners. Um, I reached out to former councilman Fred Hagen, who had built the Little Free Library at Mayor's Park, and uh, he was very happy to help and anxious to help. Uh, Music Construction has donated up to $1,000 in materials to build these, and um, RMA has stepped up to provide the bases, uh, which they provided the base at Mayor's Park. So um, it's truly going to be uh, probably a, a project that's not going to cost the city anything. Well, that's great. And uh, it's exciting that we could kind of have four legs on this uh, uh, chair that we can use to help uh, lift maybe the people's needs here in the community. So uh, it's great that we have that. Are there any other questions on the uh, Marshtown Blessings uh, donation boxes? And then wasn't there the art part? I'm, I might have missed that. Uh, if Councilman Hibbs, did you talk about the art portion of that, the art box? No, I'm sorry, Mayor. I left that, I left that out. We are going to do one additional box, um, and we're hoping to get that installed up at uh, uh, the Johnson Building there. Um, well, we already talked to uh, Dean Watts, and he's agreed to, to help us out in that respect. And uh, Roche had asked if we could do something like this where we it's uh, donatable art supplies, whether it's markers or crayons. Uh, coloring books, stickers, anything like that that may mean the world to somebody right now that uh, is looking for something to do for the child and keep them occupied. And we want to provide that as well as a, uh, the other five donation boxes. Uh, uh, we think that'd be a, a really, really neat addition to the community as well. Okay, thank you guys for your help. Um, and I also want to uh, take a moment here too to talk about you know the council members too. I, you know, I tried to keep everybody in the loop on this as we were developing these plans, you know, all last week and we wrote up some and I sent them out and many of you contacted me and asked questions. And some of you I even ran into on the street uh, as we we're practicing social distancing here in the community and we could talk from a distance about this. So uh, all of you all really were a great help, help uh, to me and the staff and Kim, uh, putting these, this final proposal together. So I really appreciate it. Uh, all of the council members and your input on this and, and, and our staff who helped. So um, if there's no other questions, this is just a first reading tonight. We will do a meeting like this tomorrow at uh, 12 noon to do a second reading on this uh, uh, budget amendment, which funds these four relief programs and projects that we have in proposed this evening. So if there's no other questions, we'll uh, move on to the next uh, item on the agenda. And Kim Houston, thank you for joining this evening. I know you don't, you have plenty on your plate throughout the day, so we wouldn't expect you to stay on for the rest of the night. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, Let's go back in and get back up to the start of our agenda. And we'll go to um, the Jerry Wiley, Wiley uh, Waste Treatment Plant Lagoon Liner Replacement. And I'll have uh, Jessica Filiatro to uh, speak to us about this bid. Yes, as we had discussed at some previous meetings, we had and had had in the budget, the liner at Lagoon Number 1 at the Jerry Wiley plant had... Um, started seeing some disrepair and some tears. And through the course of the last six months, it went from just needing to be repaired to uh, actually creating some very significant rips and tears that were not gonna be able to be repaired. So we needed to do a full replacement. So we put out this project for bid and we had a very successful bid uh, in my opinion. And we, you can see in your bid tab that we had three contractors that put forth um, proposals and the low bidder is Easy Construction Company Incorporated out of Louisville, Kentucky. And their bid came in at $525,612. And you can see the next bidder was $543,300. Um, so they were pretty close with the third bidder being still under our engineer's estimate at $626,290. 
We also had an, an deductive alternate. So depending on once we get the lagoon completely drained uh, and the sludge removed from that basin, um, there could be a potential to reduce that price even more with this deductive alternate, depending on the condition of the actual subgrade underneath the lagoon liner. So uh, Convirons Engineering is our consultant on this project and they checked the references and provided a letter of recommendation and everything is checked out. Um, so I guess at this time, I'll see if any of the council members have any questions. Jessica, was this mm -hmm. in our budget already or something unanticipated completely? I had uh, money in the budget to do a repair. Um, and then again, about mid-year, we realized that we were gonna need to do a full replacement of this. Of this. Uh, the amount that's in the budget currently, I believe is around $70,000. And I don't anticipate that we'll uh, pay out up to that amount in this current fiscal budget. So I'm working on uh, the 2021 budget that will have the remainder of this construction in that, in that budget. Okay, thank you. So Jessica, you did say just now that probably start, won't get started on this project formally until after July 1. We'll actually get started. Um, we're, they're doing re sledge removal beginning next uh, next week um, okay. or the week after. So they're lowering the lagoons right now. So that's going to happen in this last quarter through May. Mm -hmm. And at the earliest, the contractor will likely be able to begin work with this construction um, on June the 1st. So there'll only be about 30 days worth of payables um, by that time. Okay. Jessica, can I ask the question, Jessica? Sure. On on the bid tab, uh, Jessica, you had there's a what's what's the deductive alternative? What's it, what is that? I'm I'm not familiar with that. This was a price um, we had the base bid inc include considered once they take the entire liner out, remove all the water from the the lagoon. Uh, we anticipated that there was a lot of some regrading and kind of raking and harrow disking along all of the banks of the lagoon and the bottom of the lagoon. So we, again, but we couldn't see it when it's actually in service until we get everything removed and you kind of demo everything out. Um, so this is a basically a credit that will go back to the city or that will be money not spent or paid out out of the 525, uh, 600 if they don't have to do that volume of work along the bottom, the entire bottom of the lagoon itself. So this is if it's not as bad as we anticipated and that regrading is not necessary. So, so that, they that's could, what they, the is. They could pay up, they could, they, there's a possibility they could, they could take 32,400 off this bid price, possibly. Correct. Up, Correct. up to that amount. Yeah, up to that amount. Okay. Um, yes. Okay, all right. I just, I just didn't understand that. Okay. Yeah, it's a little confusing. We, but in this case, we wanted to have a worst case scenario. What we think, you know, could happen, and the bid needed to be included, and then what would happen if, um, once we uncover it, it's really not as bad. You know, because again, it's all got a liner over top of it and okay. covered in water. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions for Jessica? If not, I would ask for a motion then to uh, approve the recommendation by city engineer and also the uh, consulting engineering firm of Ken Byron's to award this contractor $525,612 to easy construction of Louisville, which is a low bid uh, for the uh, lagoon liner replacement. So moved, Mayor. And motion then by Councilman Doze. We have a second. A second, Mayor. Second by Councilman Hibbs. Any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. All opposed. Motion is carried. All right. Um, thank you all. Jessica, you want to talk about your Coleman's Crossing Royal Crest Pump Station replacement and the uh, engineering agreement we need to act on this evening? Yes. Um, also, this 
year, we the city conducted an engineering study to evaluate the condition and the capacity of the 10 inch force main along 245 that goes from Corman's Crossing on into empties out near Ben Irvin Road, um, where that waste stream is then goes to the sewer plant for treatment. Um, and over time, there's been lots of people that have asked, you know, can additional growth occur? Where can that occur? And at this point in time, we're looking at nearly you know, 20 years of age on the Corman's Crossing pump station. And there was a potential new development uh, to go out for with additional uh, need adjacent to the Corman's Crossing pump station. So in evaluating that, um, we determined that there needed to be an upgrade in order to permit that use, that, that development, that growth um, for the Corman's Crossing pump station. But as you increase that pump capacity and the pump rate at Corman's Crossing, you start affecting the other stations that pump into that pump, that force main all along the 245 corridor. So what that also, by saying yes, that also required an upgrade to the pump station at Royal Crest, which is there um, by hometown, behind hometown pizza. So this um, agreement basically provides the full engineering services to do the design permitting easement um, drafting uh, for the two upgrades at Corman's Crossing and at uh, Royal Crest. And it also includes the bidding process and any resident inspection needed for, for the process. And, and we, just, just for the council, we use HDR quite a bit. They're very involved with this right now on some other uh, waste treatment distribution projects that we have. That's correct. And because they were the one involved in the modeling the system, um, they already have that built in. So that was that development and preliminary engineering work has already been done. So it was kind of fast paced them a little bit. If I were to hire a different consultant, they would have to take all of that data and kind of dub recheck and um, add additional time and money into that design work. So, so Jessica, this is Joe. I don't know how you do this. Um, <laughs> This, this new development that you're maybe talking about out in that area, uh, is, is this primarily because of that? And, and uh, would, would that suffice out there had they not or not want to join later? Or is that is that's the main reason for this? It's kind of twofold. One is the age of the Corman's Crossing Station, and it's not um, actually pumping at its original design capacity and, and hasn't for some time. So even as Corman's continues to develop and still hasn't um, been completely developed out, there's still a couple of phases left, a couple hundred homes, maybe not quite 200, but at least 100, maybe 150 homes still left to be um, developed in Corman's. So for instance, that station is pumping at about 325 gallons a minute and it's designed at 500. Um, but again, there's an additional 100 gallon per minute for a new um, development adjacent um, back out there. There's some, been some communication too that the developer is looking at participating in the Com Corman's Crossing upgrade and in their prorated capacity for what they're going to be utilizing. Um, but again, this is something that is needed. But again, anytime you add that additional uh, head pressure into that line, it affects what the other systems do. Uh, probably within the next five to 10 years, there will need to be uh, less than, I'm gonna say five um, upgrades done to Miller Springs as well for these reasons, as those developments continue to develop and um, fill up um, how those pumps act. Because again, it's not a water line, it, it gets pretty complicated. Um, but if they're all trying to pump in at the same time, it, eight o'clock at night when everyone's home from work and running their dishwashers and doing their laundry, um, all those systems can't pump in at the same time. So you have to make sure that they can overcome that pressure. And again, when everything was first developing and starting out out there and they were only, you know, 20, 30 homes in each development, you know, there really wasn't much issue at, at that time. 
So we're having to consider those situations and still be able to provide service to all of our committed customers uh, in the area. So you did say that the developer might pay part of that upgrade? Yes, okay. yes they, it's going to be prorated based on the percent of capacity that they're utilizing for the station. So it's mm -hmm. um, fair and we've already had um, conversations with the developing team and their engineers. Um, and again, it's all trying to be fair, but also not have the existing rate payer uh, bear the full cost of all of that, so. Good, good. Mm -hmm. So Jessica, as, as the system develops, <clears throat> are, are some of the costs offset also by system development charges? This is David, by the way. <laughs> yes, there's, we do receive system development charges that go into a, a separate account and they can help uh, fund some of this work. Um, but we've kind of had, as we normally do in, in Bargetown, we kind of have spurts of that, um, those developments. So we've got a lot of systems uh, around and about the same age at this point in time. So we're kind of hitting a lot of them. Uh, the improvements and upgrades are needed at once. So um, also later on in the evening, you're gonna see a resolution, but we uh, plan to try to uh, get a KIA loan a low interest loan um, to help spread this out so it's not so impactful to our budget and um, to the customer as well. Thank you. Okay, we have any other questions for Jessica? I have one more, please. All right. On the, All right. The, comp the compensation on this particular one is $150,300. Is that uh, figured into our budget or will that go into the next budget? There is money currently in the budget in uh, for designing of upgrades of pump stations. The entire cost um, originally was not planned. You know, this was kind of a, a development that I we didn't know about when I created the budget la this time last year. Um, but we should, we do have funds because there's some other projects that we've not authorized in that 6140 professional engineering service budget uh, that I plan to utilize. Also, their majority of this um, will be in next budget. So I'm carrying it over. I'm prorating the amount of this 150 that's going to come out of the current budget and what I anticipate will be paid out in the next budget. And again, the loan that we are applying for has a lot of these fees uh, built into that as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything? Any other questions? If just on this. If not, then I would ask for a motion to approve uh, entering into this agreement with uh, HDR Engineering for as our consultant for the Corman Crossing and Royal Crest Pump Station uh, replacement project. For the recommendation mm -hmm. of our city engineer, Mayor, if uh, if I may be in order. Uh, Bill Shackles, I'd like to uh, recommend that the that the mayors be able to to uh, uh, so execute this agreement between HDR engineering engineering firm uh, for one hundred fifty thousand three hundred uh, to proceed with this project for our uh, city engineer civil engineer. Okay, thank you, Councilman Shackles. Do we have a second? Second, Mayor. Second by Councilman Buckman since he's, his mug came up first. <laughs> I thought you were going to say older, so thanks for that. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? If, if not, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All, oppo all opposed? Okay, motion's approved. Thank you. All right, we move on. Thank uh, Jessica, you got a lot tonight. Looks like uh, this one is not too 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 difficult here. This change order number four with Scott Ritter on the Round Creek contract for the Potter Shop Pump Station. You want to walk us through that one? Yes, this is a, a change order for just some additional time uh, extension with no additional monies being requested. Uh, we had a wet um, January, February, March. Uh, it's finally started to dry out a little bit in April, 
but that's kind of created some uh, last minute coordination. You know, a lot of different folks are trying to be in that small space at one time. Um, so they have requested uh, additional days. The original contract um, final completion date was uh, tomorrow. So I was trying to get this request if they definitely needed it um, to get it in for this tonight's meeting um, without going over and looking at liquidated damages. So they've suggested and think that there's about uh, two weeks worth of rain days that we feel comfortable with as long and that should allow them to final their coordination with Salt River with some of the electrical um, things that need to be finalized at the Potter Shop pump station and get the um, pump manufacturers and uh, script micro screen folks in to do startup initiate those items here in the next two weeks. So we're in the final final rung here. I have a question for Jessica. This is Coach Rowe. Uh, is this the first time that you can remember that we had a change order that didn't cost us money? <laughs> uh, they don't come up very often, but I think there have been a few more when they ask for additional time. Uh, I think the contractor likes it when we approve these extra times because it doesn't cost them money. Um, we're not charging liquidated damages. Um, but you're right, they, they're few and far between. Coach Rowe. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, if, if, if none, I'd ask for a motion to approve the uh, request for 15 day extension on the Scott Ritter contract for the Round Creek, uh, or excuse me, Round Creek slash Potter Shop pump station uh, work. So move, Mayor. All right, we have a motion by Councilman Williams. Is there a second? Second, sir. Second by Councilman Butman. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All aye. opposed? Aye. Right. Motion, or all. Any opposed? All right. Motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, Jessica, you've got a request for service from the Copperfield subdivision phase six, looks like. Yes, this is just following standard procedure. Any, this is the, another phase of the of Copperfield subdivision that is uh, being designed right now. Um, it's a request for water and sewer extension. The existing pump station at Copperfield's development uh, has capacity. The water, all of those things were originally um, considered when saying yes to the preliminary development plat for Copperfield's. So this is just a request that provided the water and sewer mains all are designed and compliant um, with all local and state uh, guidelines that we accept upon its completion, uh, these, this infrastructure into our public system. And then uh, I've got a couple of questions. So this will be fully bonded, I guess, for the, uh, the cost of the construction. Um, this will only be bonded if they choose to final plat before the infrastructure is completed and tested and taken over. But if it, if they choose to final plat before all of the, uh, this water and sewer infrastructure is finished and accepted, then yes, there will be a utility subdivision agreement um, with a letter of credit for the remaining value left to do. Otherwise, then they don't get a bond, but we uh, have to sign off on it prior to them being able to final plat it, I guess. Correct. There would be at plat signature, we would need a subdivision agreement with a commitment of a timeline. Generally, that's a year out, um, such that by the time the goal is that by the time that uh, the lots are selling and a builder is building a home on that parcel that the infrastructure at that point would then be completed and tested and ready for uh, the city to hook services to. So there is, and that's why there's a bond if it's not complete by that time, in case they fail to follow through with that, the city has that uh, surety to go in and finish that so that service can be provided to the individual request. And um, 
is this developer is is this the same developer who's developed the most recent phase in this development or is it a new company this is the same uh developer that did the most recent phase is there a, do you have a name do you know who the what the name of it because it's not in robin's letter i guess yeah it isn't in robin's letter um to my knowledge, this all of the remaining uh, future development parcels were purchased by Brooks Hauk and I believe um, Earthworks, which is Jacob Hurst Construction Company, um, is the contractor that's been building the utilities for the last phase. Now I'm not sure if they if that has been um, finally decided upon, but I believe this is um, Brooks Hauk's development. Okay. So can I just ask again, can I ask for a little clarity then on that bond? I'm not sure if I followed that. So if it if it require a bond, uh, what exactly, I mean, does that mean like if he went in and got some of it done and started selling off or how, did, what is that? Do you mind explain that further for me? I'm sorry. Yes, so this is actually in the county. So there's not a land disturbance permit that I can, that I would issue that would be handled through uh, Brad spotting at the county, but from a utility standpoint, if the final plat allows the developer to start selling lots and uh, pr even prior whether completion, so if it's if I'm asked to sign the plat, uh, so he can start selling lots. There's a certification block for whether it be street, water infrastructure, sewer infrastructure uh, that says these in this infrastructure has been completed in accordance with all. Um, rules and regulations and requirements, and we are take we accept this into our system, or it has been approved, but not all constructed, and we have a bond in the amount of X number of dollars to cover the finishing of that improvement. What's not done? So there's generally we have a what's called a subdivision agreement for utility installation that has a schedule A of values that's evaluated prior to any signature of the plat. So if they've got everything installed and maybe they're needing some final dress and raise, uh, maybe they still need to set some fire hydrants and, and uh, they're finishing up the last bit of sewer, but they've got 80% done, there would be a value associated with that and there'll be a bond, which is generally in this form, a letter of credit that would be recorded and signed with the subdivision agreement and uh, the schedule a and they would have a time period to get that done and the subdivision uh, rules and regulations give the developer one year from signing of the of the final plat to complete that infrastructure okay yeah <clears throat> and that's that's common that's typical that's been since the i want to say the 1990s or even early 2000s, it might have been amended, but that's been the policy um, always. So that's why sometimes you see a final plat and it'll have a, a, a dollar amount written in on the certification block and other times it doesn't. And if it doesn't, that generally tells you that that infrastructure is already there, ready to go and completed. Jessica, what kind of capacity will be left on the uh, Copperfields lift station after this addition? Um, Copperfields lift station was only designed to handle the Copperfields overall development plan. So everything that was on the original preliminary plat and overall development plan that um, is on file, both with the city and in the planning and zoning office, that station has the capacity to handle that development. So until Copperfields is developed out, it should handle all of that flow. I'm not seeing any indication that um, Copperfields pump station is being overloaded or seeing more flow than anticipated. Uh, the only thing I really see out there is really an unprecedented amount of excessive wipes than any other neighborhood in the city. I don't know why, but I have, we have to clean for the last five years. We've had to clean it out two to three times a year. Uh, in comparison to once every two or three years for any other station. So not sure why that's such a problem there, but it is that station itself from a pumping capacity has the ability to finish out this 
planned development. Now that doesn't mean that any adjacent property that was not part of the original development plan, that the station has capacity to support that. So that would have to be, again, any future requests like that would have to go through and be engineered and support, show if it needed to be upgraded or other solutions. Thank you. May I ask a question? Yes, of course. Jessica, would it be appropriate to have um, the developer send a letter, maybe include it with his HOA billing for the year? Because I know there's an HOA out there asking people to cut back or alleviate putting those wipes in. We have sent we have sent out mailers um, about once or twice a year for the last three or four years asking okay. them to do so. Um, I have not seen any real major change. I'm hopeful that I've been doing a little bit more. Hannah uh, has been helping me put some stuff out on Facebook, reminding people of that, because again, we're starting to see with everybody home um, and apparently it's toilet paper shortage. People are flushing <laughs> down some stuff that they would rather, I would rather that just go in the trash. Um, right. But to your point, we could probably try to reach out to the HOA directly. Um, I'm not sure how much participation they have or how active their HOA is, um, but any help that I can get getting that word out to really help us. It, it was getting so bad about a year ago that I was trying to determine if there was an, a way to even create an additional surcharge to those customers because only right. that neighborhood, you know, was having to have that level, that same level of maintenance. Um, right. And it does cost money and it, it creates problems with the pumps and sure well and i think i think that hoa is billed annually i think it's a hundred dollars a year and it's billed annually i believe okay maybe i can see if there's a, a contact information or something filed through that organization um to where maybe i could if they could send something out you know maybe right they, i'm sure they probably do things about cleanup or you know mowing or something each year. Jessica, I have a question. So are you saying that disposable wipes are not disposable? Or are we talking about the other kind of wipes? Uh, that's all debatable. Whenever we find wipes, we don't um, try to, we, it's not discernible about what kind yeah, of wipes they are. Yeah. Um, but if you can just even disposable wipes, if you notice, they are definitely have a different texture and are much thicker than toilet paper. So okay. um, generally you need something that's going to dissolve almost immediately. And if they don't, it can really create problems. They mm. snag on things and create a lot of blockage and they almost create a big, I don't want to get too descriptive here on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, Didn't we just not too long ago, uh, a, a correct or do something one of our ordinances about this yes do, yes yeah. we we passed an ordinance to prohibit those items but again that trying to get um compliance with our customers is um not always easy but i do i i do want people to know that it's causing problems for the city sewer but it's also causing if they continue to do that or flush those kinds of things, it's going to cause problems on their end as well. Right. Okay. That's a bad day. Talk about being stuck at home <laughs> with your children <laughs> and your, everybody at home. That is a bad day. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's finish this stuff up. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot ahead of us tonight. Yeah. Yes. Uh, then, uh, so if there's no other questions of Jessica. We'll ask for a motion to approve, uh, acceptance of phase six of the Copperfield subdivision for our uh, into our existing uh, gravity and sewer system. Need a motion? So move, Mayor. Motion for Councilman Williams. Do I have a second? I'll second it, Mayor. Second for Councilwoman Hart. Any other discussion? All right, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We've got the um, minutes of the 
last meeting we had, which is also a special since we did it uh, kind of in a studio setting at the council chambers, March 24th. If there's no additions or revisions, we can approve them by unanimous consent. All right, we'll move on then. I'll call on Aaron Bowles to give us uh, uh, our March uh, financial report and review. And this is something that we decided we wanted to start having so that you all can have a better feel for the month to date and year to date activity uh, financially. So Aaron, I'll turn this over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, so ever since it started, I've been trying to include some um, detail whenever I send out the monthly revenue and expense reports to you all. Uh, but I wanted to be able to kind of expand on that and uh, hopefully uh, give you guys a little bit more detail than what you're used to. And just to let you guys know from a month to month basis what's happening in the, at the city financially. Uh, so in your packet, I've created what I'm hoping is going to be a fairly simple and easy to read format for you all. Uh, I know the numbers get uh, a little overwhelming sometimes just when that's all you're talking about is numbers, numbers, numbers. But uh, I've broken it down to uh, three categories, revenue, expense, cash and investments. Uh, and in each of those categories, I've broken it down to where you can watch what's happening in both the general fund and uh, the combined utilities fund. Um, so each month I'll provide this. Hopefully at the first meeting, I can have all those numbers ready. Um, I'll send out the revenue and expense report as I normally do each month, uh, hopefully a day or two in advance of the meeting. Um, and then I'll include this on the agenda and we'll uh, be able to kind of look at it, take a little bit deeper dive into the numbers uh, and what's going on for the month. So if you guys have that pulled up, we'll just kind of look at a few things. Um, revenue on the general fund increased $636,000 for the month, um, 88% or almost $564,000 from occupational license fees. Year-to-date revenue, um, we were at eight. 4 million or 68% of the budget. Um, on into combined utilities, their revenue increased 3.1 million and 95% of that, almost 2.9 million, came from uh, general service charges throughout the uh, different departments. Um, the year to date revenue at combined utilities is at 60% of budget uh, or $30.8 million. Um, Aaron, if, Aaron, yeah. quick question: With the, in the, in this uh, in the revenue department, are are you are you anticipating? I see the the sixty eight percent in the rev, in the general fund, the sixty percent in the combined utilities. With some of the concessions that we're going to be making because of this pandemic deal, do you still anticipate us being okay uh, through the fiscal year uh, 2000, 19, 2000? Uh, yes, I, I think we'll still finish uh, in the black. We won't be in the red. Um, the occupational license fees are going to take a hit, but uh, activity is not really slowing down. We still continue to get payments. Uh, even during this, this month, uh, we're seeing quite a bit of activity still. Uh, I'll know a little bit more probably later on in the month uh, as to how bad the, those fees are going to be. Uh, affected. Uh, there are a few line items throughout uh, the various general fund departments that um, won't meet budget. Uh, uh, property tax revenue had an error in the budgeting line. Um, and then uh, there's another line item in fires department and just the way that that was accounted for prior. Uh, and we'll discuss that probably in May as we go into doing budget amendments. So, okay. Um, All right. Well, I was just looking, we got after, after, uh, after this month, there's only a couple more months left now looking at the 60%. Yes. Yes. Okay. But anyway, as, as we get through the budget, as we get into the budget discussion, I guess we, you'll be able to elaborate a little more on that. Right. Right. Okay. okay. And we'll have to, I'll have to do a, an amendment for each fund. 
uh, and just kind of examine those as we get closer to the end of the year. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll be able to detail out what's happening and why it's a little short. Um, and, and there's some that are a little over. So um, I don't think it's going to be, as far as the COVID pandemic, we're going to take a hit, yes, but we're still well, especially on occupational licensing fees for we were well ahead of the curve going into this. So what you're saying, we were tracking ahead of what we budgeted yes. going in before this pandemic uh, hit. Yes, in occupational license revenue. Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. All right, I won't interrupt you more. Go ahead. This is a whole lot simpler than what we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the expense side, uh, the general fund had increased expenditures throughout the month of $785,000. Uh, 49% of that uh, came from salaries, benefits, and payroll taxes. Um, the total year-to-date, if, you know, if you notice, if you compare revenue expense and you look at the year-to-date numbers, the overall comparison to budget is, is pretty on target for both revenue and expense. So revenue had we're at 68% of budget and revenue, but we're at 66% of budget uh, uh, for the expense in the general fund. Um, so that's showing a, a good relation that we're not outspending and outpacing uh, revenue that's coming in. Uh, in the combined utilities on the expense side, uh, we had total month-to-date expenditures of $4.9 million. Um, the electric purchase resale, we had uh, two bills hit last month. Uh, it's just due to a timing of the invoice and how they withdrew those funds out of our account. Um, overall, that line item still only at 62% of budget. Um, and, and I forgot to mention the nominal change would be 75%. If everything happened on an even month to month basis throughout the year, we would we should see an uh, about 75% of budget. Um, so we're still well under there. Uh, another big, big item that hit combined utilities was uh, we settled our bond payoff. The series 2010 bond has now paid off. It was uh, $1.24 million in actual expense to, to get that paid off. Uh, and again, the expense on the combined utilities is evenly matches the revenue. So both are at 60% of budget uh, with uh, three, three months remaining. And lastly, uh, just to go over our cash and investment position, just to watch balances as uh, all these things funnel through. Uh, our overall cash balance was down about $1.9 million uh, to a total of 15.2 or $15.6 million in our checking accounts. Um, of that 1.9 million decrease, there was 1.2 that we had uh, for the bond payoff. And then uh, we settled on that North Third property for uh, almost $375,000. Um, our investment totals decreased $112,000 to 7.6 million. Uh, we had a maturity, uh, a T-bill maturity for the cemetery fund uh, came due. Um, I chose not to reinvest anything. The yields are so terrible right now that I'm just going to hold off and uh, wait for the economy to come back up and get some of these yields back up before I start tying money into year more uh, terms. Um, and just upcoming activity, we have one T-bill that's maturing. Uh, uh, this month, so $125,000. That'd be the last T-bill uh, and pretty much the last, any type of investment outside of a, a certificate of deposit. All right, That's thank all you. Have. Anybody have a question from Aaron on any of the rest of the information <clears throat> providers? I'd like to commend Aaron on uh, this, uh, this, this financial report and a budget review because it's uh, uh, anytime we get ready to put anybody that's been involved in these budget processes, this is a this is a very uh, simple and easy to read uh, a 
review. And uh, I think in the next month or so, come budget time, it'll be a whole lot easier for us to to see where we are and where we need to be and in analyzing the upcoming budget. That's Thank right. you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. It's, it's well done. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Aaron. Good job, Aaron. Good job, Aaron. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. All right, so we have a second reading. Now we're going to uh, go to, uh, I need someone to introduce. It's um, B2020-06, it's a classification compensation plan. Um, if somebody would uh, introduce that, then I would ask uh, Audrey if she wants to read the summary. Not too long, Audrey. Somebody Mayor, if I may be in order. Yes, I'd like ahead. to introduce ordinance uh, B2020-06 classification and compensation plan an ordinance amending and adopting as amended an ordinance styled an ordinance creating a classification plan and compensation plan and have it read by our city attorney. Okay. Summary of ordinance B2020-06 classification and compensation plan. An ordinance amending and adopting as amended, an ordinance styled, an ordinance creating classification plan and compensation plan. This ordinance amends chapter 35 employment policies, the classification plan and compensation plan of the municipal code by creating and amending the title and pay grade of authorized position. The amendments and additions reflecting number of positions, type, and pay grade respectively are police strike two positions, admin assistant slash property room technician, part-time, grade 106, add one position, IT support specialist, grade 108, electric department, strike five positions, add six positions, electric lineman two, grade 119, electric lineman one, grade 114, apprentice, electric lineman 108, add the position electric groundman, grade 106, Cable slash internet department, strike one position staff engineer, grade 120, add one position network engineer, grade 115. This ordinance or parts of ordinance is in conflict herewith or repealed to the extent of such conflict. This ordinance shall be in full force and effect following publication and as required by law. This summary was prepared by me, City Attorney Audrey Hayden. Thank you, Audrey. Um, I guess I'd call on Chief Kresig and uh, Greg, to speak to the IT support specialist position. I, I, I could speak to it, Mayor. I think the I think the chief's having trouble getting hers off of mute. Um, so the IT, what they had is they had two part-time positions. They were two uh, property room tech positions that there are no longer, they're vacant positions. Um, and they're taking those two positions and creating a full-time position, um, an IT support specialist. And they de do need an IT support specialist. Uh, they've got so many computers out there and so many mobile data terminals and that they, they have a need for a full-time person to take care of those computers. That IT support specialist would also be a backup to the um, property room uh, Megan in the property room. So whenever Megan's not around, that IT support specialist will also be a backup for her. And then I think uh, part of this need has also been created by the uh, re they we're getting ready to implement the uh, body cams and there's a lot body of archiving, cams. you know, <laughs> excuse me, open records requests that comes from those body cams. So I think that's another reason for this full-time position uh, that we're being requested to uh, consider this evening. And Mayor, uh, I agree. Everything that Greg said is absolutely correct. And it's really important for, as the police department, to have an in-house IT because we draw so much on our, uh, on the city IT personnel to have them constantly coming back and forth, uh, fixing uh, the computers because we're paperless. And with all the issues that happen uh, on a daily basis, we really need to have that person uh, to, that's here on staff to be able to handle that to not draw away from the city IT on a daily basis. Okay, thank you, Chief. Um, 
then I guess we'll move on. If anyone have any questions of chief about that position? <clears throat> if not, then I'll, uh, we'll move on to the electric position. Uh, Greg, I don't, I guess you're there. I don't know if Eric's on here for the uh, electric so, groundman position. Yes, sir. The lineman position was approved in last year's budget. Um, we agreed last year to wait until this time to add that to the paying classification plan. So that's what we're doing. Um, they're not going to hire for that position right away. Um, but it was the, the money for that position and the electric grandma position was already approved in, in last year's budget. We're just now uh, adding it to the paying classification plan. <clears throat> Okay, any other questions of Greg on these positions for the electric department? All right, and then um, I don't know if the home, I know Holmes around here because he's been helping us get all this stuff set up today. Um, we have a cable and internet position, network engineer, uh, which is going to replace uh, a position formerly a staff engineer. Uh, no Holmes there, he could speak to that, or Greg, you can speak to that, please. So I can start, or um, so we, this is an existing position. We've had a need for somebody that's a little bit more focused um, and the, not just the network and make thing uh, what we have, but also uh, take a little more focus and making sure uh, we keep up with cybersecurity and all these other new threats that are evolving. So we're looking to fill this position uh, to help us uh, add additional uh, effort and in, in making sure not only to keep up with the system as it is, but also keep an eye out and make sure we stay on top of our cybersecurity program and, and, and such things that we've got planned. Any, any questions um, in the home on the network engineer position? I think that's, that position will be filled in house. Anyhow, we've got an existing uh, person that's going to move over into that position. Okay, uh, this is a first reading. We will do both the second readings for this ordinance and the uh, amendment for our relief uh, plan tomorrow at noon. So uh, we'll have you all uh, do the same type of meeting tomorrow at noon to do a second reading on both of these ordinances. And I think we have a municipal order a bit later that will also be involved with uh, uh, approval tomorrow. Okay, um, let's see, we'll move under, uh, looks like the mayor's update might be next. Um, no, excuse me. Um, uh, we have a tax moratorium on 107 Muir Avenue and um, that property in question, I spoke to Roche on it. This is the uh, home that was moved off the, uh, the Dobbs home that was moved off the Newcomb property to this new location has been sold by the uh, Newcomb Oil Company to this Bill and Sabre Maddenly and they're requesting a uh, moratorium because they're gonna do some more renovation work on it. And I did confirm with uh, Roche today that this lot actually does lie within the boundary of the historic district. There was some question about that uh, initially, but it has been confirmed that this lot does in fact lie within the historic district. Therefore, it is eligible for this moratorium. Mayor, if I may be in order, I'd like to, to recommend the approval of uh, this tax moratorium for Bill and Safer Magley at 107 West Muir. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion looks like they got looks like they got a good buy on it. Yeah. <laughs> good appraisal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you. Um, the next, uh, I think, uh, Jessica, we got to bring you back in to talk about uh, this resolution 2020-01, which is, involves our uh, request for KIA revolving loan. 
Yes, part of our full application uh, requires the passing of this resolution that basically says that everyone is in agreement to basically applying for the loan and going before the KIA board such that if they award us the money, um, everybody's on, everybody's aware that that's what we're doing. This um, resolution and uh, project profile addresses not just the Corman's Crossing and the Royal Crest pump stations that we talked about tonight, but also the American Greeting pump station upgrade that we talked about, uh, I believe it was the last council meeting or um, back in March sometime. So we basically grouped all three of those major pump station upgrades together into one loan, similar to what we've done for the three contracts for the Round Creek project, which is work at the plant, the work at the Potter Shop pump station, and then the actual trunk line that's just advertised for bid um, in the last week. So if y'all have any other questions, I'll try to answer them as best I can. Would it been, if there's no questions, I would ask for a motion then to approve this resolution number 2020-01 that uh, authoris, authorizes us to enter into this agreement to apply for the KIA revolving loan fund. So move, Mayor. It was Councilman Hibbs. Yes, sir. Okay, and then I need a second. I'll, I'll second. Go ahead. I think I got Councilman Sheffels on the second. Is there any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed? Resolution is carried. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, I was looking at a paper uh, agenda and then um, the one on the iPad was slightly different, so I apologize. Okay, now we got the uh, mayor's update and um, I know we've been longer than normal uh, this evening, but uh, I do appreciate uh, everybody's patience. We had three weeks since our last meeting. And um, of course, we, with this uh, relief package we put together, there's been a lot of work and needed, needed a lot of time this evening to discuss it and uh, introduce it. And hopefully we get a um, nice uh, participation by our small businesses in the community uh, that we can try to give them a leg up during these uh, difficult times. But uh, I just want to say how much, how proud I am of uh, the uh, community uh, on how they are handling this uh, social distancing and uh, the good work that they have done on that. And um, also uh, in our public and our private workplaces, I know a number of people have made major changes in the operations of their businesses. And uh, I can't thank you all enough uh, for how you all are dealing with this here in Barstown and Nelson County. And um, also our staff here at City Hall, they really stepped up early in this uh, whole issue, uh, long before there was a major uh, order to uh, make changes and shut down and uh, practice the social distancing. Uh, when I called the staff together uh, to talk about this, they came to that meeting and they, many of them already had their plans ready. They weren't waiting around. They knew that this was a serious crisis and uh, they made some great recommendations and, and, and facilitated a lot of changes within their own departments. And because of that, you know, we're still fortunate right at the, right at the moment at City Hall, we have no, none of our employees are sick. And so I'm very gracious and appreciative of that. Uh, we have kind of modified how we operate our parks. Uh, we are still keeping a portion of the parks open for green space. Um, and uh, we're keeping the playground equipment open, the tennis courts and volleyball courts, places where you can practice social distancing. And again, uh, for the most part, everybody is, uh, is uh, cooperating. And I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. It's uh, making a difference, I think, right here in Barstown. If you notice um, uh, the big box stores now, it was sort of a little bit late to this uh, uh, restricting access, you know, Lowe's and Kroger's and Walmart. Uh, in the last two weeks, they've implemented uh, procedures to limit the number of people uh, getting in their stores and 
uh, that's been a big help. And I need to thank the uh, council members uh, also and, and the people out in the community for being proactive uh, with this as because um, people are taking this very seriously. And uh, I know many of the council members have contacted City Hall and my office and a number of people in the community have done so. And they're, uh, if they see something they think is out of line, I'm very grateful that they are letting us know about it. And our staff can follow up on it. We've had a few uh, issues, but not many, uh, considering what you hear out and about in Kentucky. And um, uh, I appreciate the feedback we've gotten from the public and, and the council members. And I ask you all to just to continue to uh, keep us abreast if you think something's out of line. Uh, you know, um, this past weekend, um, uh, we had some people, and I think their uh, reasoning was honorable that they were trying to uh, do some uh, car type events, uh, you know, little rides and drive throughs and so forth to raise money and maybe do some things for kids uh, around Easter and so forth. But um, happy to say that you know once we talked to them they all cooperated they understood that the governor's order was really trying to make uh, an emphasis and uh, to everybody that we're just trying to discourage any large gatherings whether you're in the car or not uh, and I appreciate the cooperation they did because I do know that their uh, intent their, they had good intentions on the uh, plans that they were making uh, to raise money and try to make a difference with children so Thanks, thank you all for that. Um, I do want to again thank the council members uh, and also people out in the community who I called on to help us with this planning for this relief package, uh, your questions and uh, also your efforts. Uh, uh, talking to other people helped us put a really good plan together and I'm, I'm really, really happy about that. And. Uh, also, another thing I'm happy about is Jan Johnson sent me this. You can't really see it on screen very well, but she sent me this uh, uh, notice that we rank six in the state of Kentucky in our participation with the new uh, 2020 census. And we're at 55.2% overall. And that's uh, as of April 8th. So I know that number has gone up, but still want to encourage people to take the time to complete the survey because it's uh, very important that we get an accurate census count for a lot of reasoning. Uh, a lot of our funding for a lot of important organizations and agencies come as a result of, of that count. And so uh, once you do it, you can't fix it for 10 more years. So getting it right the first time uh, will be uh, really appreciated. So keep up the good work. Um, one thing I would say is that, you know, uh, we all hear all the numbers every day, or a lot of us read them and see it on TV. You know, we have a relatively small number of cases here in Barstown and, and Nelson County in the coronavirus. And I think it's, it's a result of two things. Number one, I think, as I said earlier, we're all doing a really good job, I think, with the social distancing and uh, the recommendations of the CDC about uh, hand washing and uh, the governor's recommendation of staying at home and not doing any unessential trips and so forth. But I also think that uh, number has been influenced by the uh, testing. And I think Kentucky has still not gotten their testing ramped up anywhere close to where we want to be. I do know locally, I was told earlier this week that uh, we've got uh, a larger supply of test kits available now here in Nelson County. And we're happy for that. But again, it's still somewhat limited. So uh, the uh, restrictions on uh, how they'll be uh, allocated are still the same, uh, not necessarily restrictions, but the protocol on how they'll be allocated are still the same. You know, the symptoms have to be there, uh, particularly a person that's uh, at risk, and then certainly be available for any of our first responders um, who might need to be tested because uh, we don't have just a, uh, a huge supply. So uh, that's that's going on, and I think that number uh, we'll we'll see rise. I think you know all the reports in May is going to probably see our peak here in Kentucky, and probably hopefully no later than that for Nelson County. And um, a big thanks to our first responders. Uh, that's why I decided to wear this blue tie and blue shirt tonight, Chief K and Chief Billy. Uh, 
you guys have really done a great job along with your counterparts out in the county uh, working during this coronavirus uh, uh, time period. We, uh, according to Joe Pruitt, last report I got from him today, we have 13 cases uh, that uh, are reported here right now. Uh, two are hospitalized, eight are at home, and three have been released from quarantine. So uh, we're happy to report that. But the first responders, you guys have done a great job. I mean, with everything that you deal with every day, uh, you know, calls, responding to crime, fires, tornadoes, high winds, fatal accidents, and then you add all this coronavirus on top of that, it's just... Uh, great job that all our first responders and our health providers are doing in our community. We're, we're very grateful. So uh, just want to remember to tell everybody, let's please keep uh, keep up the good work. Don't let our guard down. Be diligent and um, let's be safe at home when we can. Um, so that's really my message this evening as an update. So uh, again, I'm so proud of our community and our staff and uh, everyone who's been involved both here in Barstown and out in Nelson County. Uh, our partners are there, they, they've done a great job. Uh, just remind you again, tomorrow we're gonna have a special meeting uh, at noon to do the second reading on the two uh, ordinances and then uh, also a municipal order, which um, we'll have to do tomorrow following up on the uh, tax, uh, on the uh, relief program. I think I'm correct on that. Um, and then we have some um, cemetery deeds. Um, uh, we have uh, Donnie, oh, excuse me, Bonnie Lewis, one grave site, Darius Wycliffe, one grave site, um, um, Shirley Maddox, one grave site, and um, yeah. Carrie Dillon, uh, or excuse me, Shirley Maddox, two grave sites, mm -hmm. Carrie Dillon, four grave sites. We can approve them by unanimous consent. And, um, oh, I missed, um, up back when we did the classification and compensation plan, I knew there was a municipal order in there somewhere. Um, this is just for discussion purposes. Uh, I think, Gary, if you or Lisa are on the line, do you want to explain that? Um, just, uh, we have to pass this municipal order to uh, affect the changes in the classification and compensation plan. So that's just for discussion purposes. We will do a formal vote on that tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, that's correct, Mayor. Anything else I forgot there? On that municipal order, okay. Oh, no, right. that'll just... Just be read tomorrow and approved tomorrow. All right, thank you. If there's nothing else. Uh... Mayor, if I could. Yes, sir. On, on a selfish note, I uh, just want to say I, I really enjoyed spending my 47th anniversary with you guys. <laughs> but um, I am going to go spend some time with the wife. All right, congratulations. Well, congratulations. congratulations, Coach. Happy anniversary, mm -hmm. Roland. Thank you guys, appreciate it. How did Rita do it that long? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, again, I know we went a little long this evening, but uh, we had a lot on our plate and uh, we deal with this everyday stuff that we have to deal with and the uh, dealing with this coronavirus. Uh, you know, we will get through this. And uh, again, I'm grateful to all of you all for the hard work and our staff for all the hard work and the hard work is going on in our community. I, Again, I thank you. So um, congratulations again, Roland, on your 47th. And uh, I'd ask for a motion for adjournment, Ben. So moved. Motion by Co Councilman Williams. Is there a second? Second, sir. Councilman Buckman, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow at noon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Mayor. Thank you, sir.